begin the book of Romans, that you would prepare our heart to receive what you have for us during this study, Lord. And just pray for every individual that's here today, Father, that you would just prompt their heart, Lord, just soften their heart, Lord. There's somebody here that's struggling, someone that's uh, not walking with you, Lord. We just pray that, that you would begin to draw them towards you, Lord. And we thank you for this time to share and just this opportunity, Lord, and ask that you bless this time together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're visiting today, if this is your first time here, welcome to Calvary. It's a good day to be here because we're going to be starting the book of Romans today. And I'm just going to be doing an introduction to Romans today. And next week we'll jump into chapter 1. We're going to talk today more about uh, Paul. I'm going to introduce to you Paul in the event that you don't know who Paul is, we're going to also introduce to you uh, what Rome was like at the time. And hopefully, uh, if we get a chance, we'll get to the outline of the book today. I don't think that we're going to get there today, but we will get to some of that. Paul is one of the most influential writers of all time, and the book of Romans is no exception. The book of Romans has impacted the lives of many, many people throughout history. And we just finished studying through the book of Acts, and we were introduced to Paul. And most of us in here are familiar with Paul. But if you're not familiar with Paul, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to introduce to you Paul, formerly known as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He's the person that wrote the letter to the Romans. And so I think it's important that we understand who Paul is. I'd also like to give you a brief overview of what Rome was like in those days. So Paul was a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia, which is in modern-day Turkey. It is said that at the time there was no less than 500,000 people that were living in that area at the time. Today, in the same area, there's about two and three quarter of a million people that are living there. The city today is built on top of the old city, so there's been little to no excavation that has taken place in that area today. Paul was a very, very zealous man. We know that from other books we've read. And uh, prior to his conversion, he was out persecuting the church, persecuting Christians to the point of death. As a non-believer, Paul was educated under the renowned rabbi by the name of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, where he acquired a thorough knowledge of Jewish laws and traditions according to Acts chapter 20, 22, verse 3. It's the same Gamaliel who advised the Sanhedrin to treat the apostles of this young Christian group with moderation. Gamaliel's argument was very simple. If Jesus was a false prophet, as many others have been, the movement would soon fade into obscurity. If, however, the work was of God, he pointed out, you cannot overthrow it. And I would say today, based on what we see, that the work is of God. Because Christianity is still alive and well today. Nothing has been able to overthrow it. So Gamaliel was a wise man in making that statement. Paul, we know, was a Pharisee. He was a strict Pharisee. He had a form of religion in him, but he didn't have the Spirit. That is, he didn't have the Holy Spirit residing inside of him. He was following the letter of the law. He was following man's understanding rather than God's understanding and God's laws. You'll recall when Paul was on his way to Damascus, he was out to persecute the Christians. He was following them in pursuit of the Christians, wanting to bring back the Christians so that he might uh, martyr some of them as well. You remember he was present when Stephen was killed, and so now he's out chasing them out again. Now, fortunately for us, we do have a short autobiography of Paul in the book of Philippians, starting in chapter 3. And I'm going to pick it up starting in verse 4. It says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm a changed man because the things that I used to do that were gained to me, he says, uh, this is so much unbelievable. the things that were gained to me, these things I have counted as lost for Christ. 
Yet I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now after surrendering his life to Christ, Paul continued living his zealous ways. That didn't change in Paul. In fact, he was so zealous for the Lord then that he was willing to sacrifice even his own life if need be. Now this wasn't the case of somebody trying to make amends for his past. Paul completely understood that salvation is received solely by God's grace. It wasn't based on how good or how bad we are, but it was by God's grace. I was recently watching the program Cops. Most of you have watched that in the past. And so I'm watching this program. There's a young man that got pulled over. He's about 22 years old or so. And the uh, police officers are trying to find something of which to arrest this young man for. And so the young man, as he's talking to the police officers, he's telling them of all the things that he used to do in the past, and now he's making amends and how he's paid his debt to society. And he's telling the police officer of all the good things that he does now. Well, the police officer didn't find anything of which to arrest this young man. But imagine if our salvation depended on whether or not our good deeds outweighed our bad. Imagine, how would our good deeds be measured against our bad before the Lord? Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that because the scriptures say that there is no one righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous. And Paul understood that God's plan of salvation was not through the law. It wasn't through man's righteousness, but it was only through Jesus Christ and through him alone. Now, there's been some debate in the past as to whether or not Paul actually wrote the letter to the Romans, because later on when we get to chapter 16, we're going to see in verse 22 that Tertius uh, says there that he wrote the epistle and he's greeting the brethren. Now, some scholars have thought that maybe Tertius is the one that wrote the letter to the Romans. However, I think that the evidences would, would indicate otherwise when you go and you read letters like uh, Galatians and Corinthians and you see the, the similarities between the letters. It would be very, very difficult to dispute that Paul is not the author of the letter to the Romans. Now, it's more probable that Tertius may have been Paul's secretary who either wrote the letter in longhand uh, from Paul's dictation, or he may have taken the letter in shorthand, and then later on he may have written that out in longhand. Of course, this would have been with Paul's approval. So here's Paul. He's writing to a church, a church that he's never visited. He's in Rome. When he writes this letter, he's writing from Corinth sometime around 56, 57 AD. In the winter time. he's on his third missionary journey. And prior to him traveling to Rome, he had spent three months in Corinth where he most likely decided to write this letter ahead of time because he was anticipating that one day he'd be going to Rome. Now Paul's plan was very simple. He's thinking, I'm going to go to Rome. From Rome, I'll, I'll go to Spain. But we know that the scriptures tell us in Romans chapter 1 that something hindered him from going to Rome. Now I don't know exactly what that was, but I would surmise that it was something to do with ministry. And I believe one of the reasons that Paul did want to go to Rome was very clear. And that was because he understood the challenges that the culture of the Roman Empire had placed upon its citizens. So what was Paul's journey to Rome? How did he get there? What led to him going to Rome? Pastor Aaron touched a little bit on that last week, but I think in order for us to, for fluidity, we're going we're to talk about this for a moment. If you'll recall in the book of Acts, uh, during Paul's third missionary journey, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he's taking some money. He's going to deliver some money that's been collected for the saints, uh, there in Jerusalem, and, and uh, he's unaware that he's going to soon be arrested there in Jerusalem, and he's going to be taken in chains to Rome. In chapter 21 of Acts, Paul was warned not to return to Jerusalem. If you'll recall, there is a man by the name of Agabus. Agabus takes Paul's belt and he binds his own hands and his own feet with this, and he says, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. 
Then in verse 13, Paul answered and he said, I am ready not only to be bound, but I am ready to die in Jerusalem for the Lord Jesus Christ. Later in the same chapter, Paul was accused of taking a Greek man by the name of uh, Trophimus into the temple. This caused an uproar in the city. The people there in the city, they dragged Paul out of the temple and they were seeking to kill him. They took him out and they beat him up. Fast forward to chapter 23. Paul goes on and he speaks of how God has called him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Now just the simple fact that Paul mentions the Gentiles as being part, potential recipients of God's grace, this really, really infuriated the Jews and this threw the crowd into an uproar and thus forcing Paul to give his defense before the Sanhedrin. Of course, Paul being the shrewd man that he was, he knew that the Sanhedrin was comprised mainly of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he knew that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. And so Paul, what he does is he says, okay, they believe in the resurrection, the, the Sadducees don't. So what Paul does is he begins to talk about how he believes in the resurrection. But what that did is that splits the two groups. They're divided among themselves now, so they began quarreling among themselves. The Pharisees said, hey, we don't see anything wrong with this guy. Let him go. And the Sadducees are like, nah, uh, -uh. They didn't want to let Paul go. They wanted to get him. So the Roman commander had to intervene. He has to get Paul. He has him locked up. And uh, I would say that by this time, you got to think, Paul's got to be somewhat discouraged by now. I mean, if you think about it, Paul's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's been locked up. And things just don't seem to be getting any better for him. How many of you have had one of those days where things just don't seem to go right? No matter what, everything is just, you're imploding. Everything's just falling apart. You know, we've all had some of those days. Things just don't seem to go well. And this was Paul. Everything seemed to be coming against him. And because Paul always wanted to go to Rome, he may have figured that if for any reason he couldn't make it to Rome during this time, he's thinking, hey, I might die here in Jerusalem. So he decided to pen this letter to the Romans ahead of time, just in case he never got to go to Rome. But the Lord appeared to Paul. And he told Paul, be of good cheer. He said, for as you have testified before me, in Jerusalem, so you will testify of me in Rome. So Paul's probably thinking, by now he's probably thinking, oh, finally, I get to go to Rome. I'm going to Rome. Verse uh, 13 of chapter 1, it says that Paul always wanted to go to Rome, but he was hindered from going. Finally, after his arrest in Jerusalem, he's taken to Caesarea, not quite the route that he had planned on taking on his journey to Rome. He spends two years there in Caesarea. He goes from trial to trial, from governor to governor. And finally Agrippa comes to Paul and he says, hey, he says, how would you like to go to Jerusalem and stand before the Jews on these charges? And Paul must have been thinking, are you kidding me? Are you guys crazy? I just came from Jerusalem. Those guys are trying to kill me. And you want to send me back to Jerusalem? Uh-uh. I don't want to go to Jerusalem. But Paul, being a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar. And he knew that. And so appeal to Caesar is what he does. So the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome. And so now we have this letter to the Romans. That's how we got to where we're at right now. Paul's reason for wanting to go to Rome was unlike any others. Many people that went to Rome in those days, they wanted to go because they knew that Rome was the hub of the world. They knew all the action that was taking place in Rome. That wasn't Paul's reason. He wasn't impressed with any of that stuff. He heard about Rome, he knew about Rome, but that wasn't his reason. He wanted to go to Rome because he wanted to go over there and share the gospel with those people. He knew that Rome was the hub of the world. If he could get to Rome and he could share the gospel from Rome, he knew that the gospel would spread throughout the rest of the world. And you know, I always say this, is Rome was the original internet. You know, you wanted something to be known, you go, you go start talking about it in Rome. That will spread like wildfire. That was the original internet right there. So how was the church in Rome started if neither Paul nor any of the apostles started the church? Because we know Paul hadn't been there yet. Well, it's quite possible that the church was started after Pentecost. If you'll recall, there were 3,000 people there at Pentecost. 
So it's very possible that, that somebody or more than one person may have taken the gospel to Rome after hearing it and they went to Rome and they planted a church out in Rome. So that's, that's very possible that that's what took place. The, the church in Rome was comprised of mainly Gentiles with some Jews. And so what do we know about Rome? Rome was the capital of the world at the time. This was the place that people wanted to go. People wanted to be in Rome. They were the superpower of the world. They were the largest exporter of goods throughout the known world at the time. Going to Rome was something similar like going to New York or maybe going to London or Paris or maybe going to Las Vegas or Lost Wages for some of you. Right? <laughs> but if you're looking for a good time, that's where people went. They wanted to go to Rome. The citizens of Rome, they were preoccupied with the riches of Rome. These were a spoiled bunch of people. These were people that had everything that other cultures didn't have. Does that sound familiar? They had everything that other cultures didn't have. Anything they desired in terms of pleasure, they could find in Rome. If they sought entertainment, guess what? They're in Rome. They could go to the local Colosseum. They could watch the gladiators fight. Now I could imagine the conversations that people would have at that time. Hey, you want to go to the, you guys want to go watch the gladiators fight tonight? Some of them are going to get killed. It's going to be awesome. That was their sport. That's what they did. You know, today's UFC has nothing over the gladiators. Those guys fought to the death. That's the way it was. You know? And so uh, that's what was going on there in Rome at the time. Could you imagine the conversations that took place after the fights? After they saw what happened, talking about how so-and-so was killed or whatever, they loved the gory details. The spectators, the people that were there in the Colosseum, they'd be yelling, they'd be cheering, cheering the fights on, yeah, yeah, get them. You know, kind of like a football game today. People are ecstatic. People are, are just having a good time. This is what these people were doing. They were yelling, cheering them on. They'd be indulging in all the food that they wanted because the emperor provided all the food at no charge that people wanted when they go to such events. That was the emperor's way of keeping the peace and keeping people loyal to the, to the Roman Empire. That's what they did. These people would go, they, they'd get all the food that they wanted to eat, and then guess what they'd do afterwards? They'd go down to the vomitoria. Yeah, the vomitoria. And they'd go down there and they would vomit all the food that they just ate because they were gluttons. Like if they vomit their food, they can go back and they could eat some more food. And they would keep on eating more food. That's what they would do. They weren't vomiting because of the gory guts they just saw spill. And so people would go down there and they'd witness these brutal killings. They were gluttons. But you know what really made Rome so special? What really set Rome apart? from everybody else, it wasn't the fights. It wasn't the theaters. It wasn't the Colosseums. It wasn't even the emperors. What really set Rome apart from everybody else was the politics and the religion. Those two things. Politics and religion set them apart from everybody else. No one in the Roman world pretended that the two were separate. In fact, it is said that in Rome, they, had, they, they claimed to be ordained by the gods. They had, at any given time, no less than 35 gods that people would worship. The emperors didn't care that you're out there worshiping all of these gods. You could have all of the gods you want. You could worship all of the gods you want. But when you put one of the gods before one of the emperors, that's when there was a problem. But if you're putting the emperor above everybody else, everything was good. No problem. And those people that you would think or that you would expect to be the religious leaders, namely the chief priests and the scribes, those people were the ones that were the political leaders of Judea. And they were allies of Rome. You would think that they're going to be the ones that are standing, standing up. Rome was an imperial world. That means it was a world that was run by emperors at the time. When Jesus called the fishermen in Mark chapter 1, these people, the fishermen, they were embedded in the Roman system. The Roman Empire during these days of Christianity, the early days, this was dominated by the people. Here's a map that I have up here for you all. Everything that you see in the pink, 
was dominated. That was the Roman Empire right there. You have up in the upper left-hand corner up here, you have Brittany, you have up here was, was France, down here you had Spain. Of course, across the top over here was Europe, and then on the east over here you had Syria and, Tur and Turkey, and then over here in the south you had the nations of Africa and other nations. That was all dominated by the Roman Empire. And it is said that Rome at the time ruled somewhere between 60 and 65 million people. That's a lot of people. Now, if you lived in Rome at the time, you belonged to one of two classes. One of two classes. You, there was a class that was wealthy, and then there was another class of people that were non-important people. 97% of the population, yes, they belonged to the non-important. <clears throat> Only about 3% of the people in Rome were ruling the empire. They were the ones that were the elite. They were the ones that were rich. Most of the rulers ruled by way of inheritance. So if you think about that, people like uh, Herod, you know, he passed his, his, everything down to his, you know, Herod of the other Herods. And that's how that happened. It was by inheritance. And these rulers became wealthy at the expense of the people. What the, the, they did is they would impose taxes, they would charge rent, people would have to pay rent, you know, on, on their goods, whatever they earned. Uh, fishermen would have to hand over 20 to 40% of their catch. I'm not even saying 20 to 40 percent of their revenue. I'm talking 20 to 40 percent. If you caught 10 fish, you had to give four, four of them to the government. You didn't even get to keep them. You know, farmers handed over a percentage of their crops, their livestock. The Romans controlled various uh, forms of communication, such as the media. They decided the design of the coins. They decided the construction of the buildings. They decided what the monuments would look like and all of that good stuff. And since the elite were only a small percentage, 3% of the population, most of the Christians fell into the remaining 97%. Most of the population at one time or another would have experienced food shortages, water shortages, infectious diseases. They would have had irregular work. They couldn't take care of themselves. And Paul is dealing with a, with a people problem. He's dealing with the Jews and he's dealing with the Gentiles. The church is growing and Paul's had to deal with these different groups. He's having to deal with these people in the church. And the Old Testament didn't give him many examples of how people, the Gentile and the Jews, could coexist. Paul didn't know that yet. He didn't know how to get them to coexist. That's something that he had to figure out. Many of the Jews had the attitude that, hey, we're the chosen of God. If you guys want to get on, get on this bus, you've got to get in the back. You've got to take a back seat. You can't sit up here with us. This is first class. Sit in the back. Maybe get on the donkey behind the bus. I don't know. But they couldn't. Many Jews, that was their attitude. The truth is that the Jews and the Gentiles alike were putting their trust in other gods instead of the one true God. That's the bottom line. That's what was happening. They were trying to find peace through other gods. They were trying to find peace through other people. And the truth is that they were fools. They couldn't find peace through people or through their works. They couldn't do it. In fact, the book of Revelation, when Jesus was talking to the church of Sardis, he tells that church, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. That's what he told the church. And then later on, he's talking to the same church, and he says, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said. You guys want to go to the vomitorium? You want to go down and you want to vomit all of your food out? Guess what? If you're not sold out to me, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He says, you can't be lukewarm. You can't, you can't be cold. He wants us to be hot. Otherwise, that's it. Now, it's interesting that things haven't changed much from then until now. People today are still trying to find peace through other sources. The problem is they're looking for peace in all the wrong places, right? It's like that song, looking for love in all the wrong places. That's what they were doing, really. <clears throat> and people today are becoming more and more desperate. Look around you. Look and see what's going on around the world. People are becoming more and more desperate as the, the days of the Antichrist are looming before us. The days of the end are coming quicker and quicker. 
So what can we expect to, to learn as we study through the book of Romans? First off, let me tell you that there are three major divisions in the New Testament. Okay? The first major division is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? In those four Gospels, we see three major events which take place. You see the birth of Christ, you see the death of Christ, and you see the resurrection of Christ in the four Gospels. And then we have the second division of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we saw the ascension of Christ, we saw the spreading of the gospel throughout all of Asia, and then finally the book of Acts ends with the imprisonment of Paul. And then we come to the third major division, which is what we're in now, which is the book of Romans. This is the third major division. In this division that we're going to be studying through, we're going to say that <clears throat> excuse me, there are four sections. The first section that we're going to look at as we move on is the wrath of God. That's chapter 1 starting in verse 18 through chapter 3 and verse 20. The next section we're going to study is going to be the grace of God, which is chapter 3 starting in verse 21 through chapter 8. And those first eight chapters are primarily doctrinal chapters. Then chapters 9 through 11, we have the plan of God. <clears throat> and the plan of God, that's God's view of history and how it climaxes with the righteousness of God in terms of salvation for both the Jews and the Gentile alike. The chapters will include not only past history, but it's going to include the present and it's going to include the future as well. And then chapters 12 through 16, we're going to read about the will of God when we get there. And this is really the practical behavior and, and how to live out your life here on this earth and living it out before the Lord. So as we study through the book of Romans, I want you to remember that as you see this row man up here, this guy here, this row man, okay? Here's what I want you to remember. He's experiencing the key words of the book of Romans, paid in full. Paid in full. Our debt has been paid in full. You can't earn salvation. You can't pay for your salvation. You can't even get on the installment plan for salvation. You can't do it. It's a free gift. Chad, you guys can come up. It's a free gift. Have you ever gone out to eat with anybody? And and you're talking with friends and you're and you're arguing amongst yourselves. Well, it's my turn to pay. No, 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 you paid last time. No, no, I, you paid last time. I, it's my turn to pay. And you're talking to each other, and you're, you're arguing about that. Well, guess what? This is a free gift. You don't ever have to argue about this. The debt's already been paid, and it's been paid in full. Now, if you want to pay for my lunch, I won't argue with you. I'll say, okay, yeah, it's your turn to pay. You're right. You know, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But... <clears throat> Our debt's been paid in full. It's already taken care of. Part of the reason that when Chet and I talked about what we're doing now is we talked about this a little while back, about having a time of a little bit more worship at the end. I mean, I still have more to cover today, but we'll cover that next week. But you know what? This really is a time that we need to remember who we are in Christ Jesus. Our debt has been paid in full, and I think that sometimes we tend to forget that. Some of us don't even realize that. And God deserves all the glory. God wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I think sometimes we have the attitude that, well, this isn't that important. What do you think you're going to be doing in heaven? The alternative isn't very good. You're going to be worshiping the Lord when you're in heaven. But he's already paid the price so that you and I could get there and no, no charge to us. It cost him something. It didn't cost us anything. And so as we come before the Lord now, we worship in these last few songs, I want you just to reflect on what the Lord wants to do in your life through the book of Romans. What does he want to do in your life? What does he want you to work on as we study through this book? What do you need to change? And I would encourage you to start drawing closer to the Lord and seeking him in all that you do. 
Father, as we worship you in these last songs, we just ask, Lord God, that you prepare us and just speak to us, Lord, and, and minister to us. And we thank you that our debt has been paid in full. That we could come to the cross, we could come to your throne room, and we know we are forgiven. Lord, we know that it's only through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we could attain salvation. And so we thank you for that, Lord, and we just lift this time up to you now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.